This morning, we find ourselves in between. Well, not really in between, more at the beginning of something new. We just finished an amazing series called Explore God. And Explore God was this incredible citywide adventure where about 370 churches studied the same seven topics. It was powerful. It was incredible. It was neat. It was beautiful watching how the city moved together in this conversation. It was as if it was guided by some other force. And I would like to say that that other force was the Holy Spirit of God. And it moved in very powerful ways. Lives have been changed and moved. As we, as we dig in to our series, our new series, um, we started out with Explore God. In this month of November, we're going to be talking about experiencing the Holy Spirit of God. And then in December, we'll be discovering Jesus. It's a really, really exciting time in the life here at Shepherd of the Hills, and I want to invite you to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, as we come before you with our hearts, with our minds, we ask that we would, we would be open to you. We would be open in ways that we have never been open before. We ask that we would let go of our history and begin to meet you in a brand new way. We pray this in your son's holy and gracious name. Amen. There's a couple things that Mr. Coulter asked me to remind you of. And the first thing is, uh, we don't want you all to forget about your pledge cards. Um, we are collecting our pledges for the 2014 uh, budget, and we need your help. Um, this is how the church determines how it's going to fund its next year. It's through the pledges of congregants just like you. So if you haven't already taken and filled out one of these cards, we encourage you to, to prayerfully consider what gifts you can give back to the church. We would be honored to receive those. And they are located in the far back of the, the sanctuary. The other thing is... This Sunday after church, following church, a lot of our students are going to be meeting at Mighty Fine Hamburger um, for our Mighty Fine Invasion. So if you're getting hungry for lunch at the end of this, we want to invite you to come join with us and eat some good food, laugh, and just be a family together. How many people like Mighty Fine Hamburgers? Eh. How many people don't care? Eh. Okay, good. <laughs> good, good, good. All right. Now, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of those topics in the life of the church that gets people a little bit antsy, a little bit uh, uncomfortable. So here's what I want you to do. Everybody say it with me. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now I want you to say it like uh, you're from a charismatic church. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to find ourselves somewhere on that end of the spectrum. Somewhere in that spectrum, you'll find yourself either at Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit. Okay. So just say it however you want to say it. One, two, three. Yeah, right in the middle. There you go. Awesome. You guys are good. You guys are so good. Now, the Holy Spirit, again, is one of those things in the life of the church that people get really confused about. And here's the conversation I hear a lot. What do I need the Holy Spirit for? I've got Jesus. What do I need the Holy Spirit for? I have Jesus. And it's a great question because we have talked about Jesus and we have delivered Jesus as Lord and Savior. And he does everything he redeems, he restores, um, and he is the one that we you know, pay most tribute to. We talk about God the Father a lot. We talk about God in Jesus a lot. But the neglected portion, I think, is the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about God's Holy Spirit very much. And so during this month of November, I want to invite you to dig deep into the Scriptures, to take a hard look at what the Bible says and how the Holy Spirit actually plays out in all of our lives. Can you do that with me? Good, 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 good. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a New Testament invention. It's not something that just happened when Jesus showed up. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit was around in the Old Testament, right at the very beginning. It says the, his, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters during the creation. And the Holy Spirit is there all throughout the Old Testament, popping up. All you have to do is look. The Holy Spirit moves and guides and even speaks to the prophets. The Holy Spirit is a powerful part of God's story for his people. Now, the Holy Spirit also becomes a much more um, visible character in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we hear about things like uh, speaking in tongues, healing people, prophecies being given. It's, it's pretty powerful. Um, and when we talk about the Spirit today, we often talk about the Spirit as he gently guides 
He leads. He nudges us. It's the whispering voice of God. And I want to let you know that God is, in the Holy Spirit, all those things. Powerful gift-giving and quietly nudging and guiding. So as we dig into this Holy Spirit, I want you to understand that trusting and receiving God's Holy Spirit is vital to your continued growth in your faith. I don't think we work well as a Christian family when we try to do things just on our own power as opposed to doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. So a father gets up in the middle of the night and he walks into his daughter's bedroom, their brand new baby daughter. They just brought the baby. Uh, this is the first night that the baby is not in the, not in the room with mom and dad. The, and he's leaning over the crib and he's just looking at this amazing, amazing thing. And, and it's just so, so touching. And the wife noticed that the dad was gone. And so she got up and went in and saw him peering over the crib and just staring with amazement. And she was moved because she could see how deeply the father was being moved in this scene. It was just so powerful. Uh, he, he, just this the awe on, on the dad's face as he's staring and looking down that she comes up behind him and wraps her arms around him and says, a penny for your thoughts. And the father is just welled up with tears, just absolutely amazed. It's, it's incredible. It's phenomenal. How... How can they make a, a crib like this for only $99.95? It's so sturdy and durable, and it went together so... E yeah. Sometimes we miss the gift for the wrapping. We miss the gift for all the wrapping. In, this, in that little scene, the father was overwhelmed by the crib and not the child. The, the center of the picture should have been the baby, but the father was focused on the craftsmanship of the crib. Sometimes I think that's how we are. Um, we, we look at what God gives us and we only see the outside and we don't see the depth of the, the heart of what he's giving us. The Holy Spirit is this powerful portion of God that's sometimes a little bit spooky, a little bit scary, a little bit uncomfortable. But just like um, at Christmas time, there's, there's different kinds of people that receive it. You know, folks, when they get Christmas gifts, that they open up their present really slow, they, they pop the tape off real easy, they, 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 they slide the ribbon off. They, and then there's the other people who get the gift, and what do they do? They shred the paper and get to the gift. Right? This morning, I want to invite you to shred the paper and get to the gift. Find yourself at the gift. Now, as Beth said, we're going to be talking about the baptism of Jesus, and there's a lot of water language that's going to be, that we're going to be talking about. And um, I want to let you know that I think the church is, in so many ways, like the Father in the story I just told you. We get caught up in the wrong things all the time. It's real easy to get caught up in the details as opposed to the important part of the story that we're going to be talking about this morning. The details are what ended up creating all these different denominations. Like, we're, we're concerned in this image that we're going to be talking about, in this scene in Scripture where Jesus is being baptized, where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all show up at the exact same time. This is one of the only times in Scripture where this ever happens. It's the most amazing scene in all of the Bible, I think, one of the most. And the question that the church asked, and people like me asked, was, well, did they dunk Jesus? Or did they dip him? Did they splash him with water? How did the actual baptism happen? We're caught in the wrapping and not in the gift. If I was to think about that scene, I would not be concerned about how they were dunking. I would be thinking about, did you see the Holy Spirit? Did you hear God's voice? Did you see Jesus? We get lost in those details all the time. The Holy Spirit uh, is, for me, as I understand it, the power of God. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the promise of God for every single one of us. Let's take a quick read of the passage. This is in uh, Luke chapter 3. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and he was praying. 
Heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. A little understanding of baptism back in the day would be, would be really helpful. As I understand it, there were two understandings of baptism when this, this event took place. The first one was in the Jewish context. If you were a Gentile, a non-Jew, and you wanted to convert to Judaism, you would have to go through a ton of different rituals to get yourself ready, prepped, and clean. Uh, You'd have to go through a ton of different classes. You'd have to change your entire life, all culminating in this one moment when you would be baptized. You'd be dunked in the water, and your old Gentile life would wash away, and your new life as, as a member of the Jewish family would begin and that would happen in that baptism moment. The other understanding of baptism was baptism was a commercial word, a word that meant, uh, was used in the the, the fabric business, in the dyeing business. What would happen is if you had a, uh, a plain fabric and you wanted to give it color, you would dye it, right? And so you'd have to take the fabric, dunk it into the dye, and they would say you would baptize it in the dye and then remove it. And as you remove it, you would notice that the fabric had taken on both the color and the smell of the dye. It had, it had been changed by its contact with the dye. It would never be the same again. And so baptism was a commercial, commercial word. And both of those talk about the radical change that happens when there's a baptism. And I think there's a radical change that happens when there is a reception, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is when God's Spirit moves in you. A little more context. Jesus had to travel all the way from Nazareth down through Samaria to get to where John was doing this baptism. And John's baptism was a baptism of the repentance of sins. John was saying, if you do this, after you get dunked, splashed, dipped, or whatever happened, turn away from your sins. Turn around and go back the other way. Don't do the same mistake again. And Jesus got in line for this baptism. Now, we all know that Jesus never sinned. Jesus had nothing to repent of or repent from, but he got in line. And Jesus waited in line. That blows me away, that Jesus got in line and waited. He's he's God's son, and he just waits in line no special privilege, not even at his own baptism. But something really amazing happens in this scene, in this baptism scene. See, so Jesus travels all the way down, and um, when he gets there, and he gets in line, and he comes to the front of the line, I imagine that John's like, who is this guy? I kind of recognize him. Is this the guy I was talking about? And as he gets in the water, that's when everything goes crazy. I want you to picture the scene of a, of a, a little league ball game, okay? And, and the, 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 the little tigers are playing against the giants. And there's a dad in the stands whose son is the smallest player on the team. And the, 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 the giants are just beaten up on the tigers, just beaten up on the tigers. And this little kid who's up to bat for the tigers, he comes up to bat. And when he gets up to bat, the father in the stands starts screaming and going nuts. Woo! That's my son! Go! Go! Home run, boy! Home run! Scream! Kill it! Kill it! Get it out of here! Just cheering like mad. In this moment in Scripture, God is a father. Because... As the heavens open up, God cheers. God cheers for his children. God cheers for his son. He said, this is my son. And it's awesome. And not only that, he gives him a gift. The Holy Spirit. It says it descends like a dove. We have our own dove here. Descends like a dove. And what I, what I want you to notice is that the Spirit never returns It doesn't say it it goes back and ascends back into heaven. It stays with Jesus. It's a powerful image. God cheering, giving a gift, and that gift of all that power, of his presence, of his promise, it stays with him. Now, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a thing, a force, a voice, a bird, or even Jiminy Cricket. 
Although it's manifest in many different ways, as fire, as a dove, as the wind, and so on, the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is God. It's God's presence, it's God's promise, and God's power for us. And just as God in heaven, our Father in heaven, gave us Jesus Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit to be with us, to to comfort us, to counsel us, and to guide us. Now, the Spirit is often called the the comforter, but one of the things I want you to remind, remind you of is those who are already comfortable don't need a comforter. Those who aren't sick don't need a doctor. Those who aren't lost don't need or don't believe that they're lost, don't need directions. And I don't think the, com- the Spirit comforts those who are already comfortable. And maybe as men and women of the faith, we've gotten really comfortable. Maybe we haven't taken the risks to step out in our faith. That's, maybe that's why we don't see the Spirit in the powerful ways that we've seen the, the Spirit show up in Scripture. I liken the spirit to to GPS, uh, the global positioning satellite system that lives in my phone, because if I didn't have a GPS system in my phone, I would be lost and I would never make it to any of my meetings. I just wouldn't. I I don't know where anything is, and I'm dependent on it. And the best thing about my GPS is while I'm driving and I'm trying to get someplace and I miss my exit, what does it say? Recalculating. That's right. Recalculating. It doesn't get mad. It's just nice and recalculating. It doesn't even say it, it just shows it. And it always says, please make a U-turn at the next intersection. <laughs> please make a U-turn. And, and, but it's guiding me back because I'm dependent on its guidance. When I get lost, it guides me back. So if you have a desire to know the Spirit better, to be born of the Spirit, to encounter and engage the Spirit better, I want to invite you to do a couple things. The first is I want you to risk more now as opposed to risk more later. Risk more now meaning take the risk when you feel that God is nudging you, pulling you, inviting you to say or do something. Do it then as opposed to do it later. Risk more now. It's much less demanding to think about God's will for your future than to ask what he wants you to do in the next 10 minutes. It's much Less demanding to think about God's will for your future than to ask what he wants you to do in the next 10 minutes. I want to invite you to do something a little bit scary. Because I think if we're talking about the presence and the power and the promises of God, I want to invite you to invite that presence, power, and promise into your life today. To say, Spirit, fill me. Spirit, move me. Spirit, change me. I want you to start your day with a simple prayer. Be with me. Lead me. Guide me. And I want you to remember the powerful promise of the Spirit, that that God gave us a Spirit that was not one of timidity, but it was of power and of love and of selfless. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the Spirit of God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and discipline. Uh, a pastor friend of ours, Francis Chan, tells a story of a caterpillar. And you have to imagine life, what life is like as a caterpillar. A little tiny fat bug just inching around on the ground. A little, little antenna, some have long antenna. Some are pretty, some are furry and scary, some have dots. But they're all pretty much stuck on the ground. And as they, what do they do most of their life? They just eat. That's all they do is eat. I can relate to the caterpillar, okay? And... Um, And so the caterpillar cruises around, and then one day it says, I want to get a better view of what's going on, and climbs up in a tree. As it climbs in the tree, it gets tired, says, I'm going to take a nap. Hooks itself to a tree and takes a nap, takes a long nap. And while it's taking a nap, something incredible, something amazing, something changing happens. Because inside of that little chrysalis where, where the caterpillar started, everything disappears Matter of fact, the caterpillar disappears. It turns into an ooze, a goo. And out of the, I know, it's gross, isn't it? Uh, out of that ooze, out of that goo, comes a brand new creature. 
a butterfly. So imagine what the caterpillar's thinking when it climbs out of that chrysalis for the first time. It remembers being a caterpillar, right? And all of a sudden it's like, check this out. I got wings. And from crawling on the ground, it can now take flight. Everything is different. Everything is different. Last story. When I was a young man, I really, really liked my car. I liked my car a lot. And so I did lots of cool things to a car like a young man would do. And in California, we went to drive-in movie theaters. There's a few left. I know there's not many left right now, but I went to the drive-in theater. And occasionally, um, you would see people with spotlights on their cars, and they'd be really cool, and they'd shine the spotlight on the screen, and, whoa, check that out. Well, I wanted to be one of those cool guys, but I wanted to be super cool. So I bought myself a 10,000-watt candle power light, okay? The kind of thing you would find on a helicopter, you know, you know just bl blind everybody. And so I hooked it up to the, directly to my battery, put a hole in my car, dragged the wire all up to the front, and it was awesome. So when people broke out their, their super lights, it's like everybody's like, little flashlight, little bam, my flashlight. It's like super amazing and powerful. I was like, oh, that was cool, that was, I'm cool. It's because I modified it. I made it work. I made it work better. Arr, 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 just was good. So I decided I was going to go to the snack bar. And, um, and I put my light down, went and walked over to the snack bar and waited in line forever like everybody has to wait in the snack bar. And I'm heading back, and another guy's walking back, walking to the snack bar, and he says, oh, by the way, your car's on fire. What? He says, what do you mean? And as I walk back, there's like smoke pouring from the hood of my car. Just pour it. So I open up the hood, and the wires that I had added and modified to my car were now glowing red hot. And basically, my car was on fire. So I had to yank those wires out and quickly, quickly get a fire extinguisher and put the fire out in my car. It was more exciting to watch me than it was to watch the movie. But the point of this story is this. God's Holy Spirit refuses to be modified. Okay? You can't have God in balance with the rest of your life. There's no God and my life. It's God is my life. God refuses to, to be in balance. Bible translators have often had a hard time coming up with words for Holy Spirit. And in one, one particular instance, uh, they're translating for uh, uh, a language in Africa, and they just don't have a word for Holy Spirit, and the there's nothing to reference it at all. And so they're sitting on the docks watching the porters carry luggage from the boats to, the, to, to wherever they're taking them. And what the guys will do is they'll, they'll put all these things on their head, and then they'll, they'll run them to wherever they need to go. There's always five guys, but four of the guys would put stuff on their head, and the fifth guy, well, he didn't put anything on his head. He just ran alongside him. And so I would be thinking, well, that's obviously the boss. He doesn't have to do all any of the hard work. And the guy said, no, 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 that's not it. He is, um, he is the one we call the one who falls down beside us. And then they, they explain. Well, what happens is as these guys are running and carrying this stuff, often they get tired and some will stumble and fall. The one who falls down beside us will help us get back up and he will carry our load alongside with us. And boom, right there, they had the word for the Holy Spirit, the one who falls down beside us. God's Spirit is available to all of us. His power, His promise, His presence, all you got to do is ask. I want you to think about the person that you know in your life that you would say is the most Spirit-filled person that you know. In my life, it was a man it is a man by the name of Dave Fitch. He approached me on a regular basis. He worked with me in my student ministry in Southern California, and he always started our conversation off with this. Hey, Mike, how's your quiet time going? Because he knew my heart, and he knew where I struggled. And he would share his heart with me, and he was open and honest and deep and caring. And, and he was the example for me. He showed me what it looks like to be a man who loves God and is led by the Spirit. Who are those people in your life? Can you follow their examples? Invite God's Holy Spirit in you today. Allow Him to do His amazing transformation in you. Allow His presence and His power and His promise 
to dwell deeply in you. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we need you more than we could ever imagine. As we try to do so many of this, so much of this faith following you on our own, when we do it on our own power, we do stumble, we do fall. God, help us remember that you've given us one who runs beside us, who will never, ever, ever abandon us. Help us to trust in, in the promise that you've, you've given us in your Holy Spirit. Help us to trust in the power of your Holy Spirit. And help us to lean into the presence that is with us right now as we make choices today about how we're going to follow you, how we're going to be born anew in you. Father, hear us as we pray.